please be seated. And thank you to the choir. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for being here, and thank you for being patient. I'll do a few introductions. My name is Ian Janrell. I'm Deputy Vice-Chancellor of Systems and Operations, so you can understand why I'm here. But I think the other important thing is I have the absolute privilege of also being the Deputy Vice-Chancellor who has a very close association with the Faculty of Health Sciences. So it really is my privilege to be here. The first thing I want to do is just introduce to you the folk who walked into, the, into this auditorium. And I would welcome the Dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences, Professor Shabir Madi, the Head of the School of Clinical Medicine, Professor Dania Ballot, Professor Shane Norris, who will, you will meet later on, who will do the, do the vote of thanks, and of course, and most importantly, our inaugurating professor, Professor Lisa Micklesfield. And I was saying to Professor Micklesfield as we were waiting outside while things were set up that we do these things to test the capacity of the inaugurating professor to deal with all these unknown things in front of friends, family, loved ones, colleagues, and of course our online audience as well. So welcome to all of you. It's wonderful to see so many of you here in the Senate room in Solomon Mishlangu House here at Wits University, and I also recognize our online audience this evening. Now, with no further ado, I'm going to ask the Dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences, Professor Shabir Mahdi, to step up to introduce our inaugurating lecturer. Professor Mahdi. Uh, thank you, Prof. General. Good evening, uh, colleagues, and a special welcome to friends and family of Prof. Lisa Mixville. So it gives me a real pleasure to be able to introduce uh, Prof. Lisa Mixfield uh, in relation to the inaugural lecture that she'll be providing. Lisa is a research professor and deputy director in the South African MRC WITS Developmental Pathways for Health Research Unit at the University of Witwatersrand and leads the Adulthood and Aging Research Program. She is a visiting professor in the School of Human Development and Health at the University of Southampton in the United Kingdom. After completing a PhD in 2004, she, was, she completed a postdoctoral fellowship at the Research Unit for Exercise Science and Sports Medicine at the University of Cape Town and then made the right choice and came back to WITS, <laughs> focusing on early life and current determinants of bone health in children of different ethnicities. In 2008, she was awarded a two-year Hillel Friedland Research Fellowship, followed by an 18-month research fellowship at the MRC Mineral Metabolism Research Unit at the University of Witwatersrand. She was appointed a senior re researcher in DPHRU in 2011, promoted to reader in April 2017, and research professor in April 22. She has been a principal investigator or co-investigator in more than 20 grants awarded by national and international funders, and has supervised more than 19 postgraduate students to completion. She has mentored two postdoctoral fellows in the past, one of whom secured a Welcome Trust Training Fellowship and is currently mentoring three more postdoctoral fellows. She has published over 176 papers in peer-reviewed journals and co-authored four chapters. Prof. Mikasville, if you allow me to invite you to give the lecture. Thank you very much. Can everyone hear me? I think my daughter looks very nervous about me with a microphone. <laughs> uh, good evening um, and thank you very much, Prof. Jandral, um, Prof. Mahdi, um, Professor Ballot as well, and um, a very big thank you to all of my family, friends and colleagues for being here in person um, and online. So it's quite unusual to have a title slide without a title. And that's because I need to give a little bit of context and explanation of the title of my inaugural presentation this evening. So um, I work, as um, Professor Marty said, within the Developmental Pathways for Health Research Unit. Uh, so within the research unit, it's really about trying to understand how early life factors impact later life um, risk for disease. And you'll hear me refer to these stages of development quite often um, throughout the presentation today. So just as a little bit of a background, we move from the, the early um, life stage as preconception 
through pregnancy and infancy, which is traditionally known as the first thousand days, into childhood, adolescence, and then into adulthood and aging. So now to link this a little bit to my title, and what's, anybody who knows me knows that my family are my top priority. So it's important that when a, a, a big milestone happens in my work life, I try to link that to my family. You can see tears in my husband's eyes. Um, <laughs> so in 2004, I graduated with my PhD. And at exactly the same time, I gave birth to my first daughter. And here she is at my PhD graduation, six weeks old. Um, it's Emma, who's watching online um, from Stellenbosch University. Unfortunately, she couldn't be here um, this evening. So that was 2004. Exactly 18 years later, when Emma turned 18, I became a professor. <laughs> so I thought it was only right that my presentation this evening, and I'm sorry it's cut off at the top, is PhD to Prof, a life course from birth to young adulthood, which is Emma's life so far. Um, but of course, I can't talk about Emma without talking about Sienna. <laughs> and in 2007, I had my second daughter, um, and that's Sienna who is in the audience today, which I'm thrilled about, and there, her and Emma are at the bottom. So that just gives a little bit of context um, to my title. Of course, the rest of my family are as critical, so there you can see my husband and my two daughters on the left, so a big thank you to, to Jason for being here as well. My dad with his three grandchildren, Emma, Sienna and Ethan. Um, my sister who's also here in the audience and a big thank you to her and I think that perhaps her husband James is watching online. Um, and there they are on the top right um, with Ethan and then Jason's family um, in the bottom right. And a big thank you to all of them for everything and of course my mom and Jason's mom and dad who are unfortunately no longer with us. Um, and then my big five. <laughs> so. It's important in any career, you've, you've always got those very special, the big five. And these are my big five. Um, Professor Vicky Lambert, who um, I think is also watching online, she was my PhD supervisor um, and really provided me with loads of support um, post-PhD when I was still at um, housed at UCT and her and the HPALS team, very, very big thank you to. Um, to Professor John Pettifor, who I'm also really grateful for being here this evening. Um, he really was, he took a bit of a leap of faith at the beginning um, to allow me to start a postdoc with him in the mineral metabolism unit and still live in Cape Town, so thank you, John. And what I always remember with John is that if you ever would like anything done, you need to ask a busy person, and John is that person. I don't know really anyone who's busier than John when he was my, my postdoc a mentor, but boy, I knew that within a day I would hear from him. So thank you so much, John. Um, to Julia Goodica, who's one of my big five. <laughs> um, so Julia's a, a very close colleague from the MRC, but also a very close friend. And um, Julia and I are exactly the same age. She'll tell you I'm three months older, but we are the same age. And I remember her saying at our 40th birthdays, Lisa, we've known each other for as long as the number of papers that we've published together. So that was when we were 40. We're a little older than that now, and we've done okay over the last couple of years, so we better stay friends for many more years to, to make up. Um, and then Shane, of course, um, a huge, I mean, Shane has been there throughout my, from my postdoc. We met at a conference when we were kind of just finishing our PhDs, um, and Shane has been an incredible mentor and friend um, to me over the last um, years from the beginning of DPHRU and even before. And then, of course, Jason, um, who's also one of my big five. I can't possibly forget about him. <laughs> um, and then, of course, all my colleagues who've become friends. Um, and, and really, the people, the photos here are really just the front faces of so much. Um, there's so much behind the scenes as well, and their support teams and everybody else. And I'd like to say a really big thank you to them. Um, and thank you so much to those of you that are here, and I know some people also watching online. So... Let's get to the important part. <laughs> um, so as I mentioned, I will refer quite regularly to the, the stages of development, um, which, which I've explained before, and then also the important and NCDs. So when I speak about NCDs, I'm talking about non-communicable diseases. So those are diseases that are not transmissible from one person to the other. So things like hypertension, diabetes. And you can see at the top of the schematic here, it kind of names them, the branches and the leaves. 
chronic respiratory disease, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, cancer, and then they kind of call it other NCDs. Um, and that's where, obviously, it's absolutely critical that we recognize that mental health conditions are also NCDs. And what I'm going to speak a little bit about this evening is musculoskeletal diseases. The roots of this tree are really a lot of the lifestyle factors that increase our risk um, for these diseases. So um, a significant alcohol consumption, insufficient physical activity, smoking, um, and unhealthy diets. Um, and also what's not here and what certainly does seem to be showing a really, really important um, impact on the risk for NCDs is um, air pollution. Um, and NCDs really, um, the deaths, probably about 70% of global deaths now are as a result of NCDs. <coughs> and most adults are exposed to at least one risk factor. So one of these risk factors at the bottom um, at any one time, these risk factors for NCDs. So what I'd like to do just this evening, um, and I apologize for it being a little bit late, is I just, I've kind of broken my presentation and my research generally into four themes. So I'm going to speak about the epidemiology of NCDs, and this is really kind of the patterns of NCDs um, across various African cohorts. Um, and then I'm going to discuss a little bit about really some of the risk factors for NCDs, but I'm going to focus specifically on physical activity. That was my background, and we've done a lot of work in the measurement of physical activity. Uh, then a little bit around um, the etiological understanding of what the mechanisms are. We need to understand why people uh, present with NCDs to be able to ultimately prevent them, and a little bit of work around some of the health messaging um, that I've been involved in and trying to make an impact. So I need to just give you a little bit of background around what are musculoskeletal diseases. So musculoskeletal diseases are really diseases of the bones and of the muscles. So when we talk about the diseases of the bones that we're most concerned about, it's osteoporosis. So low bone mass that increases one's risk for fracture. And we generally um, measure bone mineral density on a DEXA scan. And that we plot it on this kind of re on a reference curve compared to young normals, and we can tell whether somebody has low bone mass and what their risk is of fracture. In terms of, uh, in terms of muscles, the disease that we're trying to prevent is sarcopenia, and that's low muscle mass together with low muscle strength and, and muscle performance. And here you can, this is also a DEXA scan, a whole body, so this is the picture we get from here. Um, and that's of a whole body, and that tells us how much of the body is bone, how much is fat, and how much is muscle. Um, and then using the muscle measures in the arms and the legs, combined with a muscle strength measure that we measure grip strength, together with a walking test measure over here, we can tell again whether somebody's um, sarcopenic or not. So a healthy musculoskeletal system, and the work I'm focusing on now, and you saw those stages of development, is a little bit more around the adulthood and aging. Um, components and a he healthy musculoskeletal system is really essential as we get older in terms of ensuring functional capacity um, and reducing disability and frailty with aging. So um, until quite recently, osteoporosis really wasn't seen of, of being major concern within sub-Saharan Africa. There was a big focus around the other NCDs and also obviously around HIV, but more recently. Um, we have started to see papers like this, kind of a call to action on fragility fractures, trying to understand osteoporosis. And this has really led to some amazing work by colleagues of mine, Celia Gregson and Kate Ward, who I think are, are watching online, and they set up the Sub-Saharan Musculoskeletal Network, or SAMSON, fabulous name. Um, and it's a research network which is really um, across West, East, and Southern Africa, and the main aim is to try to build sustainable capacity in musculoskeletal research. And I've been really lucky enough to be involved um, in this network from the very beginning. Um, and I won't spend too long looking at all of these words, but really the main thing is to try to build sustainable capacity, share learning around musculoskeletal health, Critically important is informing health policy for people to understand that this is a disease that we need to take seriously. Um, and then also, because there are not a whole lot of people doing this research across um, sub-Saharan Africa, to try to ensure that we standardize methods so that if we're all kind of measuring similarly, then we can um, really start to make much more of an impact. Um, and working with Celia and Kate, the most amazing thing is we went to a meeting when Samson had first started in Durban, um, and on the plane home, Celia and Kate managed to put together this commentary, which was then subsequently published in the Lancet Global Health. 
and what it was really about, and the title is Fragility Fractures in Sub-Saharan Africa, Time to Break the Myth. Um, and what they really managed to do is summarize some of the amazing work that kind of has been done but also needs to be done around epidemiology, health services research, the underlying disease mechanisms, and then clinical research. So really we, we need to focus our expertise and really our um, any funding. And they subsequently went on to, um, to apply for and were successful in three really large musculoskeletal grants with the Wellcome Trust um, and the NIHR, which is, known, which is the Fractures E3 study, Mufasa, and then the menopause study, which I'll un unpack a little bit for you now. So this is some of the work, and again, Celia and I'd like, I see um, June, Fabian in the audience. Thanks so much, June. So June, um, Celia and I worked quite closely together in some of this work that came out of Agincourt. So this is Agincourt, and Steve and Cathy are here. For so Thanks so much. And Agincourt is an area up near Mpumalanga. And um, June... Amazingly, I'd met you not long before she started her kidney study and said she was going to do some DEXs. And I said, well, wouldn't it be great if you added on some bone measures with the DEXs and maybe some grip strength and maybe some gait speed? And June being June said, that's a fabulous idea. I'm very happy to do it. And then subsequently collected DEXs on about 800 people. So this is the, the data that, um, from that study, which Celia then kind of championed and wrote up. And um, what we can see immediately here, looking at the graphs, what I'd like you to focus on specifically is people with osteoporosis on that DEXA scan have a T-score of less than minus 2.5. And those are the, the red bars um, at the top of these bar graphs here. So you can immediately see that um, females have a much higher prevalence of osteoporosis than males, which um, we, we kind of knew already. So it's about 19.4 compared to about 8.4%. Um, but what was particularly interesting, we also managed to divide um, our sample into what people who were infected with HIV and those who weren't. And those who were infected with HIV had double the prevalence, 37% um, compared to 15% um, of those who, who were not living with HIV. So we certainly see that HIV is, is um, the, that bone density um, certainly is impacted by HIV. In terms of um, looking at sarcopenia as well, there are a number of different um, definitions for sarcopenia, and it's really trying to find one that works, and a lot of the work now that Kate and Celia are doing um, with myself and others is to try to come up with a definition for sarcopenia that's a appropriate for our reference, um, for our um, African population. Um, and we only found in this sample 11.6% of the men and 4.4% of the women had probable sarcopenia. It wasn't confirmed. That was actually close to zero. Um, and, but what was interesting is that there was definitely a connection between the muscle and the bone. So people who um, had osteoporosis at the, of the total hip were at a much higher odds of having this probable sarcopenia. So that certainly is kind of confirming this link between muscle and bone. We then went on to collect um, some great data in Soweto as well, and this is now pass, part of our mask cohort that Julia and I are working very closely on. And so we, it's called the Middle Age Soweto Cohort. So we have longitudinal data on this cohort now. And what was amazing about this is we were able to look at the menopausal status of the women in this cohort and see how it changed over the follow-up period in our study. So we divided the women up into pre-pre, so with women who stayed premenopausal, women who moved to perimenopause, and premenopausal women who moved to post. And you can kind of um, see those different categories there. And what's really interesting here, and we're working with Tafadzwa Madan here, who's up in Zimbabwe, and he was a PhD student with Celia, and he did the fabulous stats to see how menopause changes, um, how bone changes with menopause, and how this may be influenced by HIV as well. So I'll just talk you through the slide, and what we have here in the blue is, is people, women living with HIV, and in the green is women who do not have HIV, and this is the change over here. So you can see it's a much greater decrease in, in bone mineral density in the women who are living with HIV. But what, where we saw significant interactions was the women who moved from premenopause to postmenopause and women who were postmenopausal already. So there certainly is this very significant interaction between um, menopause and HIV on bone mineral density. And that, this we showed in our, um, in our mass cohort. 
We've then been lucky enough to be able to, and this was Kate who then included our data from the MASK cohort um, into some amazing comparative work with other work that's been done in sub-Saharan Africa, in the Gambia, Zimbabwe, Agincourt, this is the data that I presented to you from June and Alicia, and then so, uh, some cohorts from the UK and from the US as well. And I'd, I'm nervous about showing you the next slide, just more because it's a lot of um, bars, but all I'd really like you to concentrate and focus on is how is really the, the concern that we now have around the burden of, of osteoporosis. Um, so these, it's the, the US and the UK cohorts on the other bottom. And again, I'd just like you to focus on the women for now, the dark red part of the bar, because that's osteoporosis. And you can see here that... Um, Hello? Oh, you can, sorry. You can see here that there's a similar prevalence in the African sites in terms of the Gambia and the Agincourt data to the US um, black population, but of greatest concern is the data from our mass cohort in Soweto um, had a two to four fold higher osteoporosis than the Zimbabwean women and also very similar to the overseas cohorts. Um, what is quite obvious here is, of course, that the men have significantly lower prevalence, um, and that's, that's not um, something that we didn't necessarily know about. But osteoporosis is relatively uncommon in men under the age of 70. So we really are starting to get a really nice hold on musculoskeletal disease and osteoporosis now in sub-Saharan Africa. So my, another important part of my EPI journey is the work that I've done with Michelle Ramsey. And again, thank you so much, Michelle, for being here this evening. And this is a, a slide I borrowed from Michelle, just to really say a, a big thank you to her as well as her team, both here and then the various study teams around um, Africa who've collected this data um, and have been instrumental in really a lot of the work that I've done over the last number of years. And the Awigen study is um, a study in sub-Saharan Africa. It's in three African countries, uh, sorry, four African countries. It's in Burkina Faso, Ghana, um, and in Kenya, and then there's three sites in, um, in South Africa. And really, in, in a nutshell, the aim of, and, or the goal of Awigen is to understand how genes, the environment, and, the li and lifestyle affect cardiovascular and metabolic health across Africa and ultimately to uncover new insights that could help to improve the health of Africans. And um, Are We Gen 1 data was collected, and it's fabulous that we actually finished data collection as part of Are We Gen 2 a couple, well, actually it, it, it was completed um, in all the sites in 2023. So there's some fabulous um, uh, longitudinal data here as well. And what I was focused specifically on is really trying to understand how many people are living with two or more diseases in these different sites. So this was a, a paper that we wrote up on the Awigen data. And I'd like you just to focus again. So anyone who has multimorbidity, as I said, has two or more diseases. So if you really just focus on the orange and red kind of parts of the bar, you will see immediately that the prevalence is significantly higher in women so they have much more orange and red in, in the women than in men. So, so more women are living with two or more diseases than men across these different sites. But very interestingly is that there's a very big difference between the South African sites who have a much greater prevalence of multimorbidity than there is in the West African sites. So um, there are many re the potential reasons for that. And this is the cross-sectional data from Awigen 1, and will be very exciting to see how that's changed into Awigen 2. Um, so what's also, the, what was the most common disease combination was dyslipidemia and hypertension. Most people were living with those two diseases. Um, and in South Africa, actually women with two or more diseases was more prevalent than women with one disease, which is of great concern. So most women are living with two or more of these NCDs. Um, and, and nothing that we perhaps didn't expect is that as one gets older and as one's BMI, how much you weigh for your height increases, one's risk for multimorbidity will increase. But what we did find was there were some kind of lifestyle correlates that tended to be different by sex. So what, uh, the mo one wonderful thing about working with Michelle as well is how generous um, she is with the data that's been collected as part of Are We Gen? And we have included that data as part of our mass cohort, um, which is now, as I mentioned a little earlier, longitudinal. So the Awigen data from Awigen 1 was included as our baseline data. We followed this, about half the sample up as part of our study um, in 2017 and 2018. Awigen 2 has kind of come in here just after. 
Um, we finished data collection in Soweto in 2021. And then we're doing, Julia and I have spent the last couple of days at DPHRU setting up for our follow-up of this cohort, which is happening over the next 18 months or so. So, on to some physical activity work. So, I hope that gave you a little bit of an outline of what we're understanding now around NCDs and particularly musculoskeletal disease. So, physical activity is kind of my, my first love and that was the background that I came into um, my postdoc with and really why I started working with, with Shane and John. Um, and so, what we decided to do, a lot of the work that I did on a Newton Advanced Fellowship with Soren Bragg in Cambridge, was to try to understand physical activity and the measurement of physical activity at all of these different life stages. This was work from Estelle Watson, who was my PhD student then, and what was absolutely critical at this time is that we need to not only measure physical activity, but we have to understand the context that people are in that we're wanting to measure. If we don't understand the context that they're living in, we can't start to try to intervene and make, make a change. So Estelle did this qualitative work. Um, she did 13 um, semi-structured interviews with women who were in their third trimester of pregnancy. Um, and she tried to get an idea of how they felt about exercise or physical activity while they were pregnant. And these are just some of the quotes. So the majority of the women that she, did, she interviewed believed that physical activity was beneficial during pregnancy. And this is one of the quotes. It helps relax the muscles so that when you give birth, the muscles are not tight. They're used to expanding. Yes, that movement and even the baby is used to the movement. And he won't be surprised. It prepares the body and the baby also. So women understood that physical activity was beneficial, but there were many barriers to them being physically active. Barriers, things like pregnancy-related discomfort, lack of time, lack of money, and also, again, just a little bit more understanding around what it meant to be physically active if they were pregnant. But a common facilitator was if they, had, if they were provided with a, a place to go to exercise safely, they would be very receptive to that. But another thing that was very, very important in a lot of the qualitative work that's been done is that there are very important role players that influence what the women are thinking. And these might be family, friends, healthcare providers, and that sort of thing. And often that information that they receive from um, these other role players may be kind of conflicting, and that does result in some confusion, and therefore not necessarily the amount of physical activity we'd like them to do. So this was a... Um, one of the quotes that came, just because you're pregnant, it doesn't mean you're sick. You're not sick at all. Go ahead and do what you normally do. Your daily routines as usual. Keep them going until you can. You know, it's so easy to be spoiled. My family, they used to just spoil me. But no, don't do this. Don't go down. Don't pick it up. Don't do this. You know. So you get spoiled easily and it's easy for you to go, ah, I don't feel like doing this and get so lazy. So this really did highlight for us the importance of really ensuring that women understood why physical activity was important during pregnancy and gave them guidance in terms of, of what they could do. Looking at, my, at the little um, schematic at the top, I'm now going to move on to infancy. So I've chatted a little bit about pregnancy and now on to infancy. And this is the work of Alessandra Priareski, who's also in the audience, um, who was a postdoctoral fellow with me at the time. And I'd always wanted to measure physical activity in infants, in babies. And I had tried, I'd applied for a Wellcome Trust Fellowship and they were like, mm, great idea, but whew, it's gonna be tough. And only having a postdoc like Alessandra, who really kind of worked through all that toughness, were we able to actually start to measure physical activity in infants. And um, Alessandra started by um, designing these amazing little infant bands and within it, you put your little accelerometer, and she did a lot of feasibility work on the material these bands were made out of, um, the color of the bands, um, the studs over here to ensure, obviously, that the baby couldn't pull it off, the little monitor that goes um, inside the little sleeve over there that, obviously, the baby couldn't swallow it. Um, and she did fa fabulous work in terms of designing these bands to then put onto the babies. She then... Um, did it. She then measured in, um, physical activity in these infants um, and, and looked at a number of different outcomes. But unfortunately, I don't have time to show you all this evening. But what I can show you, and this is, these lovely smooth curves are after Alessandra's done an enormous amount of work <laughs> in terms of making sense of the, the, um, the activity that comes off these little monitors that babies wear for up to a week. But what was really interesting in the first work that she did was that even at this young age, and these are in infants, 
that boys tend to be more physically active than girls. So you can see this kind of, certainly the diurnal curve, um, but interestingly, so the little green dots are the boys. So from a, an early age, we're starting to see that boys are more physically active than girls. And Alessandra went on to relate this to um, adiposity outcomes. She did ultrasounds on the babies to look at adiposity and fat um, and did some great work and has gone on now to do a Wellcome Trust training fellowship. Um, it also then fed into this amazing, these guidelines that Kathy Draper put together, 24 move, hour movement guidelines for birth to five years. And if you think of what I've just said to you now, what's happening now is we divide the day up into moving. These are just in babies, birth to a year. Moving, sitting, and sleeping. And how much the babies between a birth and a year should try to spend about 30 minutes of that day doing some kind of movement. If it's tummy time, interacting with mom, um, anything like that. Um, sitting, if they are sitting, that's great over here. Absolutely zero screen time at this age. That, that's a no... A, there's no, you know, 30 minutes is okay. Between birth and a year, zero screen time. And then, of course, sleep is important. And Kathy then looked at toddlers and at preschoolers as well. And this is a fabulous kind of infographic, really, around the importance of activity in early life. So moving up a little bit more, up into adolescence, um, this was work that um, I was really grateful to be able to do on the birth to 20 cohort. So some of you may know in the room that the cohort was born in 1990. Um, in, in 2000, it was extended to be called the birth to 20 cohort um, up to 2010. And then, <laughs> sorry, I lost my train. And it's now kind of just birth to 30 has really been launched um, since then. But I was able to look at the birth, the, the, the physical activity data. And this is self-report data in the adolescence between about 12 and 17 years of age. And what we did here, because we have the longitudinal data, we're able to apply certain statistical methods to, which is called latent class growth analysis, to try to identify kind of groups and what they are doing through adolescence. So what we have here on the right, these are boys between 12 and 17, and we've identified using this latent class growth analysis three groups of boys. So there's a group of boys who start quite physically active, but then the activity decreases during adolescence. There are boys who start off quite low, and theirs actually increases a bit. And there's boys that start quite low, and they really don't do much during adolescence. Unfortunately, you can see that that's the biggest group. 82% of boys do, from our sample here, and this is self-report again, but don't do so much. In terms of girls, unfortunately, that's even worse. So 89% of girls do even less and stay even less. And there are some girls, only 11% of our cohort from birth to 20, that did a, a fair bit, and this is organized sport. So we looked at how much time they spent in organized sport, how much time was in informal activity, so kind of around and about, and then how much time they spent walking as a means of transport. So this is work that um, Sarah Hansen did in terms of identifying these groups. And then what we did is we looked at how these trajectories were related to body composition at the age of 18. So what physical activity they did during adolescence and how it related to that. And what we've got here is in the boys, it was only informal activity. So um, you can see here, so it was a little different to what I showed you before, which was organized sport. Here is informal, how, how active boys are. And you can see again at 13, um, boys are there, and then a lot of the majority of boys just reduce their informal activity. Some increase. But what was interesting is that although 93% of the boys decreased their activity over, over adolescence, it was the boys who increased their activity who had a lower BMI, um, fat mass index, and percent body fat at the age of 18. So it's, it is good longitudinal self-report data to show that um, there certainly is um, some link to body composition at the end of adolescence, but there was no significant association with organized sport or with walking. In the girls, there was a lot more. So the girls who did organize sport over here, only 11% of them throughout adolescence, they had a lower waist circumference, fat mass index, and percent body fat at the age of 18. Um, this was an interesting result. The girls that increased their informal activity, which was only kind of here between 16 and 17, which was interesting, we found they had a higher waist circumference, which obviously didn't really m meet with what we would have expected. But I think there probably had a number of other factors in there that we, that we didn't measure, that we, we weren't able to, 
to use to account for that. Um, and then the girls that walked, there was a group of girls who did a lot of walking to school and then those that didn't. But the girls that walked to school um, had significantly higher lean mass index, so muscle mass for their height than those girls who walked much less. So this was great longitudinal work from the Bertha 20 cohort, um, which really showed the importance of activity during adolescence. Um, in terms of our work in adulthood and ageing, this comes from our MAS cohort, and this is um, some of the work that we did. And again, please don't, uh, this is really, I've put it up to, to just explain a little bit. This is no longer self-report physical activity. Now we actually measured it, and we measured it with accelerometers. So this is an actigraph over here that we had people wear on their hips, and this is an active pull over here that we had people wear on their thighs. And what we're able to do here is we could use these two accelerometers by combining the signals from both of them. We can tell whether somebody's static, so not moving at all, and whether they're moving. And in those that are static, we can then also tell whether they're sitting. So we all, we're both static at the moment, but Shane's sitting and I'm standing. So these accelerometers can tell um, if we're sitting or if we're standing. Um, and then combining it with some of our sleep diaries, we can tell that if, if we're lying down, um, whether we, we're sleeping or whether we're just lying down watching TV. Um, in terms of from the moving side, we're then also able to break up the accelerometers into trying to understand how much is light physical activity and how much is more to moderate to vigorous physical activity. So using this data, we then um, had, had these time spent sleeping, time spent sitting or lying but awake, so this is the baddie. So sleeping's good, not so good, sitting and lying, but being awake. Standing, much better than sitting. And then, of course, light and moderate. But we wanted to see if what I've just said to you now actually does have an impact on various outcomes. And this was, um, we used this kind of method here. So what happens if we just replace one of those activities with 30 minutes of another? So this schematic, I'd like you just to focus here. So this is sedentary behavior. So this is somebody sitting, somebody standing. What happens if I just replaced 30 minutes of sitting with 30 minutes of standing? Or if I replace 30 minutes of sitting with 30 minutes of light physical activity? And, so the, and the same. So you can see 30 minutes of sitting with more vigorous physical activity. So we were able to do this using a technique called isotemporal substitution. And this was the work from... Clement Kufe, who's in the audience, he was our PhD student then, and he looked to see what would happen if you replaced 30 minutes of sitting, for example, with 30 minutes of standing in terms of various um, diabetes risk factors, type 2 diabetes, and then work from Amy Mendham, um, who was our postdoc at the time, she looked to see how this was associated with various measures of adiposity measured by DEXA. And I've tried to make a kind of a schematic out of this. So in the men, what we found, that if they replaced 30 minutes of sitting with moderate to vigorous activity, 30 minutes of standing with the same, or 30 minutes of walking with moderate to vigorous physical activity, they had lower fasting glucose and higher insulin sensitivity. So really positive, reduced risk for type 2 diabetes. What they also had, if you just replaced sitting with moderate to vigorous physical activity, they had lower fat mass as well. So the work that Clements and Amy did really confirmed what we knew. The good news is that there's even more effects in the women. So in the women, if we were similar to what I showed you, if we just replaced the time here, which is kind of either more sedentary with more vigorous, we saw higher basal insulin clearance and lower fat mass. But very interestingly is even if you replace sitting with standing, we saw lower fasting glucose and higher insulin sensitivity. So something as simple as that. And if we replace sitting, even just with walking, light intensity activity, that was associated with lower fasting glucose. So this is work that we really are happy at, chuffed with. Um, and now as we go back into the field, we are going to be able to see how these physical activity patterns change and what impact that has on these various outcomes. So I'm really just going to do a little bit of a flying visit through some of this work. And this is work that Julia has really focused a, um, a lot of her time on an, un, an understanding. And that is that we really have to understand our kind of unique um, phenotype from a body composition um, point of view in the African population. And this was, I'd like you just to look at this graph. And all I want you to do is on the x-axis, look at somebody who's got 35% body fat, for example. If I move up here, 
the cohort from Cape Town, um, this is the woman, um, the black woman here, and this is the white woman here. But you can see if you look at central fat mass, the black women have a lot less body fat centrally than white women do. And this was some of the early work over here. What we've got is um, two DEXA scans. And this is a white woman here and a black woman here. Pretty similar BMI. But what we can see here is the white women carry a lot more um, of their fat around the central area with a black woman a lot less centrally, but a lot more around the gluteofemoral area, a lot more around here. And what impact does that have for disease risk? Because we've always known that more weight around one's waist is associated with higher risk for, for things like diabetes. So what that does mean is that a lot of internationally accepted cut points um, may not be relevant to our population. So internationally, there's certain cut points that say if your waist is over a certain amount, your risk for, example, diabetes is, is much higher. So we used our mask cohort again because we have longitudinal um, data on them. Um, and here, we looked at them from baseline to follow up. Um, and this was what um, Julia published looking at how waist circumference at baseline was able to predict insulin dysglycemia and type 2 diabetes at follow-up, approximately sort of three to five years later in the men and women. And just in a nutshell, and I'm just focusing on dysglycemia here, is that these are the international cut points. So for men, you shouldn't have a waist circumference of more than 94 centimeters because that will increase your risk for dysglycemia. And in, in women, um, it's 80 centimeters. But what Juliet did, also using um, the rock curves and calculating the Uden index, was she found quite similarly in men that in our African cohort, it's about 96.8, which is similar to the international cut point, but in women, significantly higher. So a waist circumference of 91.8 is what she then found to, was associated with a high risk for dysglycemia. In terms of the type 2 diabetes, she did something similar and found it was 95 centimeters, so significantly different to what is internationally accepted. So it certainly does seem to, to be um, something that is concern um, when, we, when we try to look at risk in our population. Similarly, we did something with the sarcopenic obesity, and I won't spend too long there, but this is really, when I spoke to you about sarcopenia earlier, about low muscle mass, um, and low muscle performance, you can, using different cut points, international cut points, you can determine a prevalence that's very different. So using this cut point, 27.9% of the people would have been seen to be sarcopenic. Using this cut point over here, not even 1%. So it's absolutely critical in our population that we try to develop um, a cut point for sarcopenia, which we've identified is of concern, but certainly needs to be relevant. Um, and we then went on to do some work using proteomics, try to understand a little bit more about what proteins or biomarkers are associated with these different um, outcomes from sarcopenia. And what we have here is we looked at muscle mass. So I showed you on the little DEXA scan how much is muscle in the, in the arms and the legs, and also muscle strength. Um, and we did O-link proteomic analyses, identified um, 182 biomarkers. And what we did here, and this is all I'm going to touch on here, is in a nutshell, we found 39 biomarkers were associated with muscle mass, but only nine were associated with strength. So just our take-home message from this, as well as trying to understand what these biomarkers represent, is also to immediately show that when we measure strength, the muscles, it doesn't necessarily mean that it'll tell us anything about mass, because there was only an overlap of eight of these 184 biomarkers for both of them. What it also showed us is that men and women are very different, so very different biomarkers associated in the men and to the women, more, many more in the men um, with muscle mass than the women, an overlap really of only two, and in the women over here, only eight biomarkers were associated with muscle mass, with absolutely none associated with grip strength. So showing again that when we look at them, we must look at them separately and we need to look at men and women separately. And Amy went on to do this as well in terms of, of some of the diabetes outcomes. And that's really work that now needs to be validated. And my last part, which is really a very, very quick whirlwind tour of some of the health messaging that we've done, 
Um, and this is stuff that we're really particularly proud of. And this was uh, really trying to, again, as I said to you earlier, we have to understand context. And we did some work with, with women um, going through menopause and trying to understand what their views and experiences were of menopause and realized that many of the women we were talking to didn't actually know what menopause was. So we had to take a couple of steps back because they, really the existing information on menopause is aimed at women in high-income countries. It's not aimed at the women that we're working with and living with. So we need to have initiatives to support women going through menopause that are much more context-specific. So we went through a pro pro process called co-production, which meant that we worked very, very closely with the women and with some stakeholders and healthcare professionals to try to then develop these information resources that women could use. So we just went through four very brief steps. We identified what their needs were from in-depth interviews. So women said, well, what is menopause? What is early menopause? How does HIV influence menopause? What are the symptoms of menopause? From that, we kind of developed resources um, with our stakeholders, and we tried to make the resources really yeah, interesting to read. Um, the design was good. The content was good. What we thought, the readability was good. And we then took this back to the women and said, well, what do you think of these? Um, and they said, no, well, I don't like the color, or the woman that you've got depicted here doesn't really look old enough, or she looks too old. And we had some fabulous sort of workshops with them to co-produce these resources. And then we refined them together with the stakeholders. And we came up with some really fabulous resources here in terms of helping women. And we've um, subsequently translated this, so it's available in, in five South African languages, disseminated it to clinics in Soweto, a similar parallel process has happened in Zimbabwe, they even have a movie that they show, um, and this has also been endorsed by the South African Menopause Society as well as NOFSA. So these are resources that women can access in the clinics to help them to understand exactly um, what menopause is. So on that note, I'd like to say thanks so much for, for being here, for everybody in person, everybody online, um, for the work, and a really big thank you. And the journey continues as I go from prof to, I don't know, we'll see. And I thought, when I put the journey, not the arrival matters, I thought my husband's going to say, well, not on a road trip, Lisa, because you always want to get from A to B. But thank you so much for your attendance. Thank you. Oh, so thank you, Prof. Mikosfil. Uh, that was a really remarkable journey of the work uh, that you've undertaken. And something which I can really identify with, uh, I was a medical officer uh, intern in 1991, and I recall being in a neonatal ward and then recruiting to this birth to 10 study. And I asked myself, what on earth are they up to? <laughs> and clearly what you were up to, what uh, Prof. Cooper, I think, was then leading it, uh, really has provided remarkable information. Uh, which is extremely relevant to the local context and the manner in which you've been able to actually take it to the next level in terms of trying to figure out what sort of interventions are, like, are needed in a setting such as ours really makes it an important resource and contribution to uh, the country. Uh, you asked what next. Uh, the answer to that is, Dean, is very simple. Uh, you stay on at the university until you turn 65 and then you become an emeritus professor. <laughs> So now it gives me pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Prof. Shane Morris to give a vote of thanks. Uh, usually uh, I'm given a bio sketch of the individual that's going to give a vote of thanks. In this instance, I wasn't given one. So for the first few minutes while you saw me on my phone, I wasn't being rude. I was trying to figure out <laughs> what to say about Shane. And I could introduce him based on actually knowing him when he started probably doing his PhD with Prof. Pet, if I recall him in the early 1990s. But what I did, me being me, uh, is that I went to chat GPT. Uh, and I'm actually surprised, I'm absolutely amazed <laughs> just how anonymous Shane has been able to keep himself in chat GPT. <laughs> uh, it gave me some sort of broad sketches and told me fill in the missing pieces, so that wasn't useful. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, so I did get something eventually from somewhere else. Uh, so Shane is uh, currently the research professor within the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Edwardesland and also Professor of Global Health at the University of Southampton. Uh, as we've heard, he's also the Director of the South African Medical Research Council de Developmental Pathway for Health Research Unit and is currently also the President of the Africa Chapter 
of the International Society of Developmental Origins of Health and Disease. Uh, Shane's research focuses on life course epidemiology with a specific interest in the, develop in the development of intergenerational risk for obesity and diabetes. His expertise includes nutrition and body composition across the life course and longitudinal cohort study methodologies. And currently, uh, I've, got, I've got a pleasure of also working with Shane on another important project that he's leading, and that is uh, leading several scientists across Africa to better understand and develop interventions that improve maternal and child health. So Shane, if I might invite you across. Thank you very much, um, Professor Muddy. Yes, I pride myself in trying to be as obscure as possible on the kind of virtual reality of the world. So I don't have Twitter, I don't have this, I don't have that. <laughs> so I'm glad that it's kind of working a little bit. Good. Um, firstly, a big thank you to Professor Chandral, um, Professor Ballet, and Professor Mahdi um, for all the support around this event. Obviously. There's a whole background of folk that, are, that have been working with Lisa in planning this event. Um, so big thanks to them and for coordinating. A big thanks, obviously, to everyone here, making the time to come and listen to Lisa and share in this incredible milestone. And obviously, to everybody online. It's fantastic that we can beam this um, presentation globally. And actually, Lisa, this is now recorded, so I'm afraid this is going to live with you for the rest of your life. So we'll be able to look at this 20 years from now and reminisce on this day. Um, more importantly, a very, very big congratulations to Lisa. This is an incredible milestone in an academic's um, career and path. I'm hugely proud of you, and it's an absolute fantastic opportunity and privilege to be with you at this type of juncture in your career. I think it's so appropriate that what you and I do is life course epidemiology, because not only is our unit about that, but actually our journey as colleagues has been like that. With John, I mean, 2000 is when we first met at an officer conference with John. Then we were both doing our PhDs in bone health and kind of started this whole journey. And John's idea is you know, it's amazing. Um, so John's hypotheses way back in the 90s is now being proven <laughs> like 30 years later. And there was always his interest around the issue of pediatric bone and the older adult and the aspect of what are we seeing in terms of potential trends for ill health. Um, you know, initially the idea of osteoporosis or poor bone health in an African population was poo-pooed. And now we're starting to see that actually the, the real value of science is looking at it not only in snapshots, but actually longitudinally going forward. Otherwise, if we just took a snapshot at one moment without reference, we may be reaching totally different conclusions. So it's been a fantastic journey between minimum metabolism and then DPHOU, bone health, life course. And I think going forward, there's just so much more we have to do. So look, at, look forward to being with you on the next part of your journey to wherever that may be. But a big thank you again to everybody and a big congratulations to Lisa. Uh, thank you, Prof. Norris. And at this stage, I would like to call these proceedings to a close. I uh, just once again to thank uh, colleagues of Lisa, faculty of the University of the Faculty of Health Sciences, family and friends, as well as those that were able to join us virtually. Your presence is highly appreciated, and we invite you to join us for refreshments outside. Thank you.